Great. Well, thank you, Nick, for, for bringing us together today. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this is a, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen and we will get right into it. Um, we're going to start at home today. Figure out how to reduce emissions and support resilience in our buildings. Um, so the first slide we have here is a, a great illustration of a main home. Um, you'll see there's an efficiency main logo on here. My, uh, my co-chair of the buildings, infrastructure and housing working group of the Maine Climate Council was Michael Stoddard, who is the executive director of efficiency main. And um, my, my guess is that many of you are familiar with efficiency main and the fabulous programs that organization offers. Uh, this, this illustration is a little bit of a guide to those programs. So each of those little yellow dots represents a place where uh, there's an opportunity, whether it is a heat pump on the wall, insulation in the attic, solar panels on the roof, or an EV in the driveway. There are all sorts of places where uh, emissions may be originating in main homes and where there may be opportunities to mitigate those emissions by using less energy, shifting to cleaner fuels, uh, shifting to lower carbon materials, and uh, really making our houses work better as a system. Why does all of this matter? Well, it matters because when we take a look at main Maine's greenhouse gas emissions profile. We'll see that when we take all main buildings into account, the residential, commercial, and industrial, we're looking at nearly 40% of the emissions. Uh, that's second only to transportation. And there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunity here, right? So we're looking today at the emissions that, that are generated directly from inside of these buildings for, for heating and cooling and everything we saw in that house diagram. Uh, the energy supply that's feeding these buildings and the embodied carbon in the materials used in the construction of these buildings. Uh, that makes buildings a top priority for the work of the Maine Climate Council. Whoops, let's go back here. So the Climate Council has been working for about a year. Uh, we're getting right up to the, uh, the moment the Climate Action Plan will be delivered to the legislature at the beginning of December. And we expect that plan to lay out uh, the steps that we need to take as a state to get our greenhouse gas emissions 45% below 1990 levels by 2030 and 80% below those levels by 2050. We also are looking to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045 and, and crucially to make sure that our, our people and our industries and our communities and our buildings are resilient to the impacts of climate change. How are we doing? We're doing all right. Uh, we've made tremendous progress. This, well, I guess this is right where we are here. <laughs> 2020. And this yellow line shows what we might expect to see over the next couple of decades. We are on track to meet our 45% reduction goal by 2030, but we have a ways to go to get to that 80% reduction. Uh, so this is what the Maine Climate Council has been tasked with, right? We started back in June 2019 when the council was established. Just about a year ago, the uh, working groups of the Climate Council were established and the members were appointed and we got right to work. So for, for about seven months, the working groups of the Climate Council looked through all of the, the data and the strategies that we know are available to us and came up with a set of recommendations those recommendations were delivered to the Climate Council in June, and they're crunching those now, uh, as well as a whole slew of analysis that was conducted by outside consultants. So we had a vulnerability assessment that looked at the climate change impacts that our, our state will likely face, and in fact is already facing 
and where we expect to see those kinds of impacts. There was a cost benefit analysis that looked at the, the relative impacts of recommended strategies in terms of economics and greenhouse gas reductions. And there was some really interesting energy modeling uh, and an equity analysis that is expected soon. That's a lot to work through. And it's, that's what the Climate Council is doing now. You can explore all of that at climatecouncil.maine.gov. But today we're gonna to really focus in on the strategies that were proposed by the Buildings, Infrastructure and Housing Working Group. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail about all of these, but I did wanna give you the high level overview. Uh, the working group laid out six big buckets of, of work that we could do as a state. Improving the design and construction of new buildings, transitioning to cleaner heating and cooling systems, that's what we're gonna focus on today. Improving the efficiency and resiliency of existing building envelopes. It's a fancy way of saying weatherizing, insulating our homes. Um, the possibility for lead by example in, in publicly funded buildings. The decarbonization of industrial processes and then all of the work on our electric grid that's necessary to support that. I mentioned the cost effectiveness uh, analysis that was done by some outside consultants as part of this process. And you'll see here that, that the strategies proposed by the buildings working group top the list in terms of, of cost effectiveness. That's not gonna surprise any of the, the many, many main people who have already invested in and, and reaped the benefits of energy efficiency. We know firsthand, many of us, that as we air seal and insulate our homes, they get more comfortable, we lower our heating and cooling costs, and we reduce our energy consumption along with all the associated carbon emissions. The other great thing about these strategies is we know how to do this. Uh, in the last decade, Maine has weatherized more than 20,000 homes through efficiency Maine programs. That, that doesn't count the, pro, the, the efficiency and weatherization work that happened outside of efficiency Maine programs. Uh, that's thousands more through the low income programs of Maine housing and community action programs. And the Buildings Working Group really recommends that we expand on that great record of success. That we make sure that we're extending those benefits of weatherization to, to households of all income levels and making sure that we really meet the needs of low income Mainers, including those who rent rather than own their own homes. Go back for just a second, because as we tackle that number three, the efficiency and resiliency of existing buildings, uh, we also recognize that it is so much more cost effective to build in those measures in the first place. It's the old ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure thing, that we can, can build in efficiency and resilience from the beginning of our buildings. We can incorporate clean energy and low carbon building materials and our working group recommended that, that we lay out a path to reach net zero emission building codes by 2035. So we ensure that the, the new buildings that we're building in this state use only as much energy as they generate, either on site or off. We are also gonna do a deep dive today and get to that, into the transition to cleaner heating and cooling. And Dana will be able to go into a, a ton more detail on, on how we make that transition and what it looks like for, for Maine people. But I can give you the high level recommendations from our working group. We know that as we accelerate the transition to low carbon and high efficiency heating systems, that, that there are a number of things of, of benefits, right? We have the potential to lower energy costs and improve comfort. There are a whole bunch of jobs associated with installing these new systems. We know, and, and Dana will tell us about this, about the, the consistent quality of the products and services and the ability to scale up this success. 
it's really important to recognize and to, to celebrate Maine's leading role in the transition from, from fossil fuel heating to high efficiency electric heat pumps. We're actually leading the nation in the rate of that transition. And, and we need to keep scaling that up. Uh, we also talked as a working group about the use of modern wood heating, which has some really interesting uh, intersections with our natural, uh, with our forest products industry. Not going to go into a ton of detail about that, but we do see here that a high performance heat pump uh, is just a, a huge improvement in an, in an emissions impact level. We also took a look at what it might, what we might see over a period of years as we make this transition. So one of the uh, sets of analysis that was done by the outside consultants for the, the Climate Council looked at what happens as we move to getting towards two thirds of our heating in the state as electric heat pumps. And then as we move towards all electric heat pumps, and what we see is there is a tremendous reduction in emissions over time. Uh, a little bit of a difference as we go through the, uh, the years, but by 2050, we are where we need to be. We see an 80% reduction in emissions as we transition to, uh, to heat pumps. I think I'm gonna leave it there for now and let Dana tell us more about what that means from a, a consumer perspective. And then when we get to the, back to the questions, we can uh, talk more about the, the Climate Council process if, if folks are interested in that. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Great, thank you very much. Exciting things happening. It's exciting to be a part of uh, this process in Maine. We're actually gonna make some progress. Um, and Dana, I'm gonna ask and see if you could turn your video back on. There you go. There and we go. There you go, we're back at it. Uh, so great, um, why don't you take it away and uh, Kathleen and I will, will shut down. Okay, great, I'll, uh, I'll, jump, I'll jump to my screen share uh, right off. Um, I have a, a good handful of, of uh, slides uh, to view uh, this morning, um, but I, I uh, really want to, um, Nick, can you confirm you can see my, uh, my slide deck all right at this point? Yep, I can see it great. Okay, super, thank you. So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Maine Audubon for, for holding this session and I'm really, really pleased to, to play a part in this and, and part of the conversation. Um, you know, I've known Kathleen for a great number of years, um, you know, prior to uh, joining Mitsubishi uh, in my current role supporting installers all across Maine and New Hampshire um, and, and doing training regionally. Um, I worked at Efficiency Maine for seven years from uh, 2010 when the trust was first formed up until 2017. Um, and played some role and, and was involved directly in the establishment of uh, the, the loan program um, that's continuing as well as uh, the structure of residential rebates for weatherization, conventional heating systems, as well as heat pumps. And so um, I've really seen this transition from a place in 2010 when virtually no heat pumps were being installed and the state was really trying to figure out how we could um, get, get weatherization off the ground and make it happen. Um, through the series of, you know, the original HESP program that was funded uh, from a DOE grant, uh, $10 million back in 2010, 2011, um, up until, you know, when we had uh, the whole stimulus and ARA grants and funding that basically enabled the, uh, Maine to establish the revolving loan fund that is active today and provides loans for people to make substantial upgrades to their homes, whether that's weatherization or upgrading their heating uh, systems um, or you know, installing heat pumps. And so um, it's, it's been an exciting period of time um, and there's a tremendous amount of work to do. And in mm -hmm. fact, it's, it's really, you know, you know, Kathleen and I have been involved in this in a number of years, but we're really standing on the shoulders of giants. There were certainly plenty of people that were advocating for weatherization, um, you know, going back decades, um, you know, inside of Maine housing and, and elsewhere. And, and we know 
that uh, this is going to take a while. Um, it's not something that we that we fix right away. And so, we, you know, it's important to continue to foster the conversation about this and keep people engaged. Um, because, you know, we're this solution of weatherizing and tightening houses and installing heat pumps and going with more renewable energy. It's the kind of thing that's going to continue to take you know, effort over this period of time. So sometimes people ask the question, well, what's new? What's going to, what's coming out? Well, what's new and what's coming out and what's really going to solve this problem is the same thing we've been doing or trying to advocate for, uh, for a decade, which is building really tight buildings and ventilating them correctly. Um, using plenty of good and sustainable insulation, you know, uh, you know, dense packed cellulose, Roxel, um, and, uh, and heat pumps are really the answer and they're continuing to get better. But today, Yesterday, last year, the tech, next year, the technology that's here and is right now um, is tested and proven um, and used throughout the globe. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's really, you know, that's the big news and the thing that's going to move the needle um, today and, and uh, next year as well. So, um, you know, here's, here's a picture of the globe and this is a snapshot from a uh, satellite back, uh, you know, six months ago, January, seven, eight months ago, I guess, nine, nine months, boy, time passes quick when you're hiding out um, and not socializing so much, I guess. Um, and really, uh, the thing I want to point out on this map is you can see this January, you know, obviously here's the polar vortex hiding out up uh, up in the Arctic. Um, and, you know, we've had times in previous, not this last winter, but the two prior winters, we'd have arms of the polar vortex swing down and, and side swipe the Midwest or Maine and make it particularly cold. And during those periods of time uh, over the last several years, you know, I've been going around and talking to contractors and vendors and, you know, and they're oftentimes when it's very, very cold, scrambling around for no heat calls. Um, and that's almost entirely been uh, a focus on conventional heating systems that are breaking down. When I go out and I ask people about the performance of heat pumps, when we get to those super extreme temperatures, it's crickets. They work at really cold temperatures um, and there's things to understand about how they work, um, but they, you can displace you know, if you adequately size equipment or have multiple systems in order to do it, even in a very leaky large house, you can displace all of the heating load uh, with heat pumps. Um, and so there may be strategies in the middle where you want to supplement it with a wood stove or with a conventional heating system, but it is entirely reasonable to displace the vast majority of your heating load in any kind of building. Um, it really comes down to having contractors and designers, architects, engineers, on board with what the constraints of these systems are so that they can select the right stuff to get the job done. Um, one, the second thing I'll note on this, uh, this image is you can see, you know, mains here in this sort of teal green, greenish blue. Well, over on the other side of the Atlantic is Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, and they have had uh, ductless heat pumps uh, in, in their, um, heating infrastructure uh, for about, a, a you know, 10 years, 12 years longer than, than we have here in New England. Um, it, the, they arrived, uh, the technology showed up in, in a way that was uh, usable in uh, relatively cold climates uh, back in the early 2000s in Europe. Um, it's also prolific in, in parts of Northern Asia um, and, you know, coming down through Canada. And so what we're seeing is this phenomenon of growth that's occurring um, and entering into the Northern United States. And, and that's part of the reason why um, Maine really is sort of, you know, a leader in this, this, this phenomenon of a growth curve of this product arrival is, is happening here. Um, and so the bar graph shows the growth of sales of heat pumps in Norway back between 2002 and 2015. And in that 12 year period, nearly a million heat pumps were installed in homes in Norway. And of course, Norway has about 5 million people or four times the state of Maine. And so, you know, in a 12 year period, you know, that's the equivalent of Maine installing something like 250,000 units, which would get us to about 50% of all homes uh, being heated with heat pumps, which is 
pretty much where Norway ended up at the end of that period of time. And, and it continued to install so that the, the majority, the, the continuing majority of homes uh, in Scandinavia use heat pumps of, of one form or another that operate in cold climates. And so our trend line, this blue line, um, is pretty much consistent with the growth activity of heat pumps um, in in Maine and also in New England. And Maine and Vermont really, you know, we're kind of neck and neck on the installs per capita. Um, and this past year, we had about 10,000 indoor units uh, installed in Maine. And using that four time multiplier, that basically puts us in somewhere in the ballpark of what was equivalent in uh, Norway 15 years ago, uh, this gold diamond. And so our normal growth trajectory, which is really quite steep, um, is in blue, the blue line here with Massachusetts and New York um, on a similar trend line, but maybe two or three years behind us in terms of their growth per capita. Um, and then the gold line and the red line are representative of the new policies that have come forward from the state legislatures. The red line for Maine to have 100,000 heat pumps installed in a five year period. Um, and the gold line representative of the objectives of New York State to have 500,000 heat pumps installed in a single year within six years. So ex extremely high growth rates already existing and pressure from policymakers to increase those further. Um, but at the same time, you can see that all those growth curves are not inconsistent with the kind of growth that was occurring uh, in Scandinavia uh, last decade. So can it be done? Sure, it's been done before, um, but it is going to involve a, you know, a, a, a real focus on, on this transition and messaging out to people about heat pumps, best practices, and you know, part of my role is training heat pump installers uh, on best practices to ensure that they're selecting the right equipment and installing it in the right ways. But you know, at this point, at this juncture, you know, Maine has the, perhaps the, the most uh, experienced and capable core of installers anywhere in the country. Um, it's really fantastic. And so um, for those of you that are on the call, if you don't have a heat pump in your home right now, um, or you haven't endeavored to, uh, you know, take care of those weatherization measures, it may be something that you should really think about um, sooner than later. There are great incentives from Efficiency Maine and the loan program allows you to uh, make it get complete a project with no upfront cost whatsoever and spread those costs over a 10 year period, pay off any time early if you, if you so choose um, up to $15,000. So there's really, you know, there's, there's a lot of great reasons to install heat pumps um, and a lot of great resources to do that. And Mainers have taken advantage of those programs. This map uh, is a little bit dated. It basically shows the installations over a four year period from 2013 to 2017. The number of dots on this map uh, since then is, has more than doubled. Um, but what you can really see is the, um, the pattern of where they're installed, where are heat pumps being installed? Well, they're being installed everywhere that there are people basically uh, in the state of Maine. So, you know, it, it's almost a perfect reflection of exactly where there's population density, whether you're talking about the Presque Isle area and Holton far up north or out to Jay, um, and then all, all across, um, you know, the central counties of Maine where the vast majority of the population is. Um, so, um, and, you know, it's also reflected in efficiency main rebate activity. There are definitely heat pumps that are being installed um, outside of the rebate program for a variety of different reasons. You know, efficiency main has, uh, you know, uh, constraints on what they provide rebates for and to whom they provide them based on the cost effectiveness and the calculations that they put forward to the Public Utilities Commission. But there are, there are good reasons to install products outside of that, um, and it's happening all the time. But just looking at what's at Efficiency Maine, um, you can see that in 2020, we had a total of more, more than 10,000, almost 11,000 heat pumps uh, installed. And that's despite 
an incredible slowdown in the industry that occurred in April and May uh, related to uh, the, the pandemic. Um, and since then, I mean, like people are living at home, they're spending more time, their offices are at home. You know, I think Nick and Kathleen can chime in on this. They're, they're experiencing that too. And so a lot of people are installing heat pumps to make their homes more comfortable year round. Um, so we're, we're just seeing a tremendous amount of activity. Most installers right now are actually booked out about six weeks. Um, and, and, you know, I, 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 I can't help but notice uh, and, and point out on this chart that um, some of these other key weatherization and heating system measures from the Home Energy Savings Program continue along at pace. And Kathleen rightly mentioned that, you know, more than 20,000 homes have been ins uh, insulated uh, and received weatherization improvements through Efficiency Maine, um, you know, since 2010 really. Um, and we had like, a, you know, kind of a fast growth of weatherization um, early in that decade up to about 2015, where it kind of plateaued around this 1000 homes per year, which is great. I mean, like those 1000 homes per year that are that are getting treatment, that's super. But really, in order to achieve objectives for weatherizing effectively 100% of the state, we have to have a substantial growth in the level of weatherization that occurs in the state. And, and you know, it's not as though the funding is not, uh, you know, somewhat robust to provide incentives towards insulation and air sealing. Um, you know, the pandemic has impacted them more dramatically than some other fields, but there is, there's a much bigger need. You, you know, we need to be doing 10, 15, 20,000 homes per year in order to meet objectives that are in law regarding weatherization by 2030 or, or, or carbon reduction goals. So um, definitely need uh, additional focus on that. Heat pumps, you know, are, are kind of a bright, shiny object. People are, are uh, attracted to them uh, for a number of reasons, including the fact that they get good air conditioning out of them. Um, and so if that drives people to install systems that they're also going to use to displace oil and propane um, and reduce their carbon footprint, I, I think that's a, a pretty good thing. Now, so I'm going to dive a little bit into heat pumps. I know that uh, that uh, Vaughn hasn't joined us quite yet, and we still want to wrap up uh, for for uh, 11:45 to allow for questions. So Nick, if if you see Vaughn pop in, don't hesitate to to uh, chime in so that um, so I can offer him some time. But you know, not all heat pumps are the same. The vast majority of the heat pumps that are installed in the state of Maine and the ones that are predominantly uh, receive uh, rebates through Efficiency Maine maintain 100% of their heating capacity down to about five degrees Fahrenheit before they start to lose some of their capacity. And you say, well, that, I mean, and this is one of the tricky things that, you know, confuses people about heat pumps. Um, they think, oh, they don't work when they're cold. When, well, they do. It's just that what, what heat pumps are doing is they're extracting heat energy from outside. So if you think about heat energy as a particle, a phonon, a, 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 a quasi you know, particle uh, from quantum mechanics, it's just drifting around the air. And the, the, uh, the manifestation of a high temperature is a high density of, of heat particles, okay? So uh, the absence of heat particles is outer space. It's, it's uh, you know, absolute zero or pretty close to it. And so even when it's very cold outside, negative 10 degrees, 10 degrees, whatever, really freaky cold, there's still a lot of heat particles dancing around in the air. And one of the things that uh, about the heat pump technology is that it uses a refrigerant called 410A that, uh, that circulates through the system from the indoor unit to the outdoor unit. And that 410A has a boiling point of negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So through the mechanics of the system going between low pressure and high pressure in the system and the compressor and the, and the coils, it basically goes into a low pressure state in the outdoor unit when you're in heating mode and dives for its boiling point. And when it's approaching its boiling point, it's way colder than it is even when it's very, very cold outside. So those heat particles cling to the outdoor coil, get transferred into the refrigerant and go into the compressor. And the compressor increases the pressure of the refrigerant and condenses and uh, increases the density of the heat particles. Oh, there's Vaughn now. And that allows the temperature of the refrigerant to get up to a temperature of 120 or 130 degrees, travel into the home and transfer that heat energy um, throughout in order to, um, you know, uh, heat your room and your house and, and your sofa and everything else. Um, and that cycle uh, is efficient because, and the reason why you get such high efficiency out of it is that 
the, you're only moving heat from outside to inside and you're just using electricity to run motors the compressor motor and the fan motors in the indoor and outdoor unit in order to move that heat energy from outdoors to indoors. And so that's why when it's moderately temperature, you know, 30 degrees, 40 degrees outside, you get incredibly high efficiency. Like for every one unit of energy that you put into the unit, you get four units of heat energy inside. When it gets very cold, like zero or five degrees, it takes more effort because you've got you've to circulate more refrigerant in order to extract that energy and move it into the house. Um, but on a seasonal basis, it's still a ratio of about three to one. And that basically translates into a very low cost of heat relative to just about anything else, except for maybe free firewood, which of course isn't really free when you take into account the amount of work that's involved in it. So that's why, uh, you know, in Maine with our electricity costs and the relative costs of propane or or oil, it's it's significantly cheaper. At 16 cents a kilowatt hour, if you run your heat pump throughout the entire season, um, and it's one of these high performance heat pumps that's uh, provided a rebate uh, through Efficiency Main, your cost on a seasonal basis is something equivalent to about a buck 55, buck 60 a gallon uh, heating oil. Of course, it fluctuates depending on the model and the, the manufacturer you choose and the uh, and the way that you use it, but it's it's a reasonable and practical practical uh, way of achieving it. So I'm going to skip over this just for time constraint. But this is basically the cycle that I referred to. You're just cycling refrigerant through and extracting heat energy from outside. The refrigerant stays in the system. Um, there's a wide range of indoor style units. Um, the meat and potatoes, the units that are installed most frequently are the wall mount units, but there are certainly ducted units as well as ceiling cassettes and floor mount units. Um, depending on uh, the preferences of the homeowner or the constraints of the home, um, you could select one or the other and some may be more appropriate than others. If somebody already has existing ductwork, putting in a ducted system makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, uh, some people don't like to see the wall mounted units on the wall. So, of course, if, if uh, you know, if they would prefer to have something in the ceiling, um, that would allow them to transition to um, higher efficiency technology. Placement is critical. Um, you want to make sure that you're placing the unit such that you get good distribution throughout the house. Um, you know, putting it behind a door like it's depicted in this, um, that has some impact. You're going to have airflow going, you know, bouncing off the door, creating a little microclimb in there. So it's not going to get a good sense of what's going on, you know, on the other side of the room or in the hallway just outside of the room. So um, really consulting with your installers to ensure that you have good placement is important. Um, likewise, you know, with floor mount units, you wouldn't want to put them someplace where they're going to be uh, potentially put under a table or behind a sofa. Um, different kinds of ducted units and ceiling units are available um, for uh, different uh, preferences um, and uses. Um, and they're being used on uh, new construction um, all the time. Modular homes, uh, this is a, a, a contractor that uh, builds modular homes in Vermont um, and sends them all over uh, uh, New England and they use heat pumps exclusively to heat the entire homes. Um, and we're seeing people uh, gravitate towards not just units that handle multiple heads, but also uh, incorporating multiple outdoor units in order to address the seasonal patterns. And this is what I kind of started out with is know, you know, the installers knowing the equipment that they need and being able to select the right equipment can provide the highest levels of comfort and efficiency. And sometimes that means multiple outdoor units in order to achieve those objectives. But, um, you know, talking to your installer or finding an installer uh, can allow you to do that and create the, the best of all worlds for your, for, your, uh, for your comfort in your home and lower energy bills and low apartment. So uh, I, uh, I see Vaughn's on here, so I want to make sure I provide him at least a couple of minutes to chime in. Uh, also a good friend of mine from a long, long time ago. So thanks again for uh, your time this morning. Fantastic. Thank you, Dana, very much. And we were joined by Vaughn Woodruff. Vaughn, are you, are you out there still? Um, I am. Hi there. Hey, Sorry. Vaughn. How are you doing? Doing well, Nick. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, so it's, a, it's 11.43 by my clock. Um, Vaughn, welcome. If you could uh, give us a few minutes about InSource and, and what you all do, that'd be great. We'll still 
um, take questions uh, in a moment. Um, please put those questions, I see them piling up already, put them in that Q&A box and uh, we'll get back together in a minute. Vaughn, turn it over to you. Great, thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, you want me to share my screen here, is that helpful? Yep, sure, uh, you're a co-host, so I should be able to do that. All right, sounds great. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm sorry for lateness. It's fall, and as such, our schedule is crazy, and I really apologize for being late here. Um, so, Vaughn Woodruff, I'm CEO of InSource Renewables, uh, based in Pittsfield, Maine. Oh, and try uh, that screen share one more time. I think I just made you. Okay, perfect. Don't see it yet. Get that rolling. Um, yeah. So, let's go... Let's go there. Yep. Okay, here we go. Should be good. Well, if not, we'll just go. On. <laughs> we'll sure. start. Go ahead. We'll you, continue the stellar presentation. So um, <laughs> we got we got five minutes so I can give a bit of a big overview. And thank you, Maine Audubon, everybody who's online. And Dana, it's good to, good to see you today. So um and chat a little bit about how solar integrates into this you know dana talked about the heat pump side of things and and once we get to efficiency generally the next piece is about generation so what what are we doing with an efficient home what are we doing with efficient technologies in order to really maximize you know a number of things whether it's climate benefits whether it's our autonomy or independence from the grid um, and, you know, what's really triggering things now is getting to a point where it actually has huge financial benefit. Um, you know, with solar technologies, um, you know, from a generation side, you know, there are a number of things to consider as we kind of move into uh, a really critical time period. And the time period right now uh, is that taking out a loan for solar, the monthly payments are roughly equivalent to the utility savings uh, from that system, which is a huge threshold to break because as we've seen throughout the history of solar technologies, it's not the environmental um, aspect of renewable technologies that typically drives markets, it's the monetary. So even though we do see a lot of folks that have that bring that perspective to the table, oftentimes it's really about um, you know, it's about making sure that it's practical. There are lots of ways that money can be invested to make uh, climate, uh, you know, benefits. Uh, and so making sure that that money gets put in the right place is great. So um, as it relates to kind of looking at solar right now for this year, frankly, what's happening between COVID and workforce and, you know, a step down in the federal tax credit is making it really difficult for folks. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of demand, a lot of pent up demand. Um, and folks who are trying to get solar this year are really gonna be looking at next year, whether they know it or not. Um, you know, this weekend's typically Common Ground Fair and it's increasingly becoming that the solar companies at Common Ground Fair typically are booking construction for the following year. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of demand. Uh, the tax credit, as I mentioned, at the federal level is stepping down from 26% this year to 22% next year. And that's triggering uh, increasing demand as well as kind of dropping prices. Uh, COVID has actually had some positive impacts from a pricing perspective in solar and that it's reduced kind of global demand, which means that the, uh, the pricing of equipment has dropped a little bit. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, we're generally the workforce issues in Maine uh, and across the country are also kind of, you know, we're, we're seeing prices fairly stable um, as a result of that because of those two competing pieces. So, uh, you know, as it relates, I'll just kind of give the big hitters as it relates to solar right now in Maine. Uh, and I think I can wrap that up in two minutes, Nick, is that I think for the public, uh, there's a really big shifting conversation that's happening right now in that uh, many of you probably, if you're online or, you know, we get one in the mail, even though we have solar on our house already from um, solar developers who are putting in community solar projects. And that's been, a, you know, Maine Audubon was involved uh, quite a bit, as well as a number of other organizations like Maine Conservation Voters and NRCM in helping to get progressive solar policy passed in the state. 
And that opens up a lot of options that can, you know, be great in some ways, but, you know, as many of you know, lots of options can also kind of handcuff folks in terms of indecision. So as you're thinking about solar and how it might help you, I think the first thing to know is that if you have the tax, um, tax credit appetite, and a site with which to put solar panels at your home, you're going to have the best short-term and long-term benefit from that investment. Um, especially as storage becomes more prevalent, uh, it's going to give you a lot more flexibility and you'll get your biggest you know, bang for your buck from an investment standpoint. Um, then you're going to see uh, you know, community solar in which it's really low, low transactional cost in and out. You don't have to make any long-term commitments and you will see savings on your electricity bill. Um, it's great for renters, great for folks that don't have that tax credit appetite. So I'm really excited about what that's gonna do for low and moderate income households across the state. And then there'll be an in-between, which is community solar that you own instead of just getting credits from it. And so that will be another model that I think it's, it's, it's gonna be a savvy niche market. But I think at the end of the day, as we're thinking about climate, um, if you do decide to move into the community solar realm and take that easy entrance in, a big piece to watch is what happens with the renewable energy attributes of those and whether you're getting the environmental benefits out of the project or simply getting money savings. And it, not to put a judgment value on either, but it's important that as you kind of take a look at those things that you're aware of, you know, if you're doing it for the environment, making sure that you get the benef benefits for the environment. So with that, I'm at 11.50 and I'll kick it right on over to Nick. Okay. All right. Thanks. Good job, uh, Vaughn, coming in. Uh, very. Speaking of efficiency, you're not wasting any time. You're coming on in when you need to speak and you get right to it. I love it. Um, thank you all. And Dana, let's get your video back going too. Um, and we let's get to some questions. So um, folks, if you have questions for our presenters, please put them in the Q&A uh, box down below um, and we'll get started. Um, we have a couple questions here about heat pump technologies. Um, they're getting, they're a little technical, so I'm going to read them uh, word for word. This one here from Thomas O'Brien. Um, and Dana, are you out there? Yep, I'm ready to go. Okay, you want to turn, turn the video getting, back on uh, if you could. There you go. Yep. So we're all, the gang's all here. Um, so yeah, Thomas, uh, yeah, <laughs> Thomas asks, if you convert an existing home to a heat pump, and the home is currently water baseboard with gas fired broiler, is the only heat pump option forced air? Uh, well, so at this point in time, uh, you know, so like we talked about 410A and, and the refrigerant and the temperature of 120, 130, you know, most, the majority of homes in Maine use baseboard uh, heat, whether it's from a gas or an oil boiler or something like that. And usually the temperature that's flowing through those baseboards is like, at least 150, if not 160, 70, 180 degrees. And that high temperature is needed for the style of baseboard that we have in New England in order to throw enough velocity of the air to distribute uh, that heat energy uh, throughout your room. So like currently the heat pumps that are available that do air to water um, are not able to achieve that high of a temperature. In Europe, air to water heat pumps are all over the place. And that's because instead of having uh, the style of baseboard that we have, they use radiative panels. Um, and people around here can install them in their low temperature radiative European style panels. Um, but unless you converted all of your base pan over uh, to something like that, the current heat pump technology that's available in Maine um, is is really uh, not appropriate for that. So you'd either put in ductless heads that would blow into the space or put in ductwork that would deliver uh, heat energy to a number of rooms. It's plausible that in time, something along those lines would come to the US, um, but they've been talking about it for a long time and it really, it hasn't manifested. You either need to have a booster, uh, um, another compressor to jump the temperature up or you need to have a CO2 system. And while there's CO2 systems, a very limited number in the United States, specifically for domestic water heating, they're not of the size or rigor in order to provide uh, what we would need to displace a baseboard heating system. Gotcha, thank you. Um, question here about sort of where to start. So say, for example, I bought a house and uh, wanted to make it more efficient. Uh, would I, how would I get started? Would I start by 
installing a heat pump or doing weatherization things or or where would uh how do you get started on this process and i'll leave really, that to anyone yeah yeah Kathleen. it's a it's a really good and common question and um there's from a from a building science perspective there's a clear answer right the first thing you want to do is is tighten up your house get it air sealed, get it insulated. And then once you've reduced your, your need for heating uh, by, by making the house more efficient, you can talk about replacing the systems. That's the building science pr perspective. The, the human perspective, <laughs> the human answer is, there's no wrong place to start. You, if what you want is to, to, to cut your costs and to cut your emissions, you can weatherize and keep the systems that you have. You can switch out the systems and get to weatherization later. You can put solar on, the, on your roof because you've really, really been wanting it and it's so cool. Uh, and all of those are gonna have a good benefit. So, uh, you know, if we were being really strict about the building science order of things, we'd have a good clear answer. The real answer is any place you start is a great place to start and it will be a gateway to future improvements. There we go, great. Um, a question here from Natalie. Um, realistically, can a consumer generate enough electricity through solar panels to power a heat pump during the winter months and be carbon neutral? That's a, that's a great question. I think it kind of goes between kind of the, the micro of a household and the macro of how our energy grid functions, right? So from a, from a micro perspective, a lot of folks aren't doing a direct powering of equipment. I mean, the only folks who do that are off grid <laughs> generally, right? So with the grid, it's a flow. It's uh, electricity on, electricity off. You know, there'll be times of the year where this time of year, you ran your heat pump, um, you know, you probably ran it this morning before the sun came up. And so obviously the electrons that are being generated from solar aren't directly powering that heat pump. Though, as we, you know, in the next month or two, I don't even want to think about it right now, but in the middle of the day, uh, when the sun's cranking, we'll be running heating. Um, and I think that lends itself more to the macro because the micro is that folks that have grid tied solar don't really care when energy is generated. They care how much is generated because they're in a crediting situation with the utility. When it comes to the macro, as we look at the grid, uh, we do want to watch kind of when we're putting peaks onto the grid and how we're dealing with that increased consumption as we, you know, move towards beneficial electrification and really move away from fossil fuels. And, and that's, being ha that's being handled a number of ways. Uh, some of it is with load management. So making sure things power on at certain times. Some of it's gonna happen with storage and some of it comes from diversity. Uh, you know, uh, everything, you know, diversification makes for resilience. And so having solar and wind and, you know, other generations such as we have biomass and hydro and others uh, can really help to, help to stabilize that in the, in the near term. Yeah, and I I just I just add to that that you know sort of from that you know a typical homeowner that's doing a grid tied installation where they have a number of panels on their house and they're they're trying to displace their annual load you know get a bunch of credits uh, booked during the summer to kind of compensate for all of the needs that they have in the winter that would exceed their solar production during those months. Just as a general rule, if you have an appropriately sized heat pump and you take energy from your solar panels that are generated over the course of the year and dump it into your heat pumps, pretty much for every 100 gallons of oil that you displace with an appropriately sized heat pump, you know, or equivalent heat, whatever it is, but 100 gallons or equivalent displaced with a heat pump appropriately sized, it will use the same amount of electricity that's generated on an annual basis as one kW of capacity installed on your roof you know, appropriately installed, of course, right? So there's a bunch of little caveats there. But if somebody said, well, I use 500 gallons of oil per year, I want to put in heat pumps and, dis and I'm going to put it up a large enough array to displace that and ensure that I'm meeting all my needs throughout. You'd anticipate that approximately the production from 5 kW would be required in order to cover 500 gallons of, of oil displacement. Great, thank you. Um, I want to, um, so we only have a couple minutes left. I, I want to 
and I think a little bit with Kathleen talking about um, the, the uh, buildings infrastructure and housing group. But first, I want to get quickly to this question from Tristan um, about home air quality, um, dust and mold, et cetera, and, and sort of how that may relate to what we're talking about, if there are considerations to keep in mind as you're weatherizing your home about also to make sure that uh, you're keeping the air clean inside. Um, so I, I, I'll touch on this. I'm sure there's some other uh, notes regarding this. I mean, like building tight and ventilating right is really part of that strategy. Um, keeping, you know, you know, filtering your air, um, having a makeup air come into the house and be tempered um, throughout the year, um, instead of having just haphazard, well, the wind's really blowing, so my, my air is ventilated because it's blown right through the house when it's <laughs> You know, that's, that's the typical ventilation in main homes and, and it's much, much better to have a tight house and have controlled ventilation, mechanical ventilation throughout. And that also affords you the ability to have, uh, you know, filtration built in um, and, and make sure that you're improving that air. Mold mildew is everywhere. It's in the air that we breathe all the time. It's really a question of whether you give it the opportunity to grow. And so mold, mildew, and all these, uh, you know, bacteria, viruses, everything requires certain kind of air circumstances, humidity, temperature in order to grow. And so if you're maintaining your winter temperature, you know, sort of between 40, 45% and 55, 60%, you know, kind of 50 is sort of considered optimum throughout the course of the year, you're going to have much less incidence of anything that, you know, anywhere in your house that would provide the opportunity for mold growth or mildew. So you know, the best thing is, is ventilation and controlling your humidity uh, throughout the entire year to ensure good indoor air quality. Great, thanks. I do wanna to get to one last question from Ernie before we uh, wrap up is, uh, how practical is a ground source heat pump in Maine versus air? It really depends on 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 the costs that you're that you can that you can manage. Uh, when I was managing the efficiency main program and we were providing rebates to uh, ground source heat pumps, they would range in cost from twenty eight thousand to eighty thousand. You know, there were outliers on either side, but the average cost of the installation was like fifty thousand dollars. And of course, there's you know there are federal tax credits that are associated with that that helps bring that down, but that's significantly more expensive. Um, than the average install of a, of a single zone heat pump, which might be, you know, five thousand dollars or four thousand um, dollars, or a multi zone system that might be ten or twelve or fifteen thousand dollars or something like that. So, um, and frankly, the difference in the efficiency between the two, um, you know, is is pretty darn close. Um, you know, I mean, like there are situations when it's really really cold that geothermal might be better if you have sufficient well space. Um, but on a, on a seasonal basis, the difference in electrical costs would not uh, overcome the initial upfront costs of doing uh, geothermal. But, you know, to each his own. If you want to do geothermal and, and power that with solar and, and not have a unit that's air source on the outside of your house, um, go for it. Great. Thank you very much. And I just want to end with a, with a question for Kathleen. Uh, she co-chaired the Buildings Infrastructure and Housing Working Group for the Maine Climate Council and provided that body with recommendations about how to move forward uh, and hopefully meet our climate goals. I'm wondering if you could just quickly cover those recommendations. Yeah, so one of the things that we, we had in mind as we were developing those recommendations is that there are really two key policy options when you think about making a transition uh, from, in this case, fossil fuel dependent heating to, to high efficiency electric heat, which can be, be powered by clean energy. Uh, and those are incentives and regulations, right? Do you, do you encourage people through, through financial incentives or tax credits to, to take the action you wanna see? Or do you create regulations that say they're not allowed to do the, take the action that you don't wanna see as much of? And um, we recommend both because it's a, a continuum. Early on, so far, we have incentivized heat pump adoption and, and we've been really successful. We need to see so much more heat pump adoption, such an increase that, that we need to keep those incentives going right now, but we're gonna hit a point at which no one is even talking about putting an oil-fired burner in their basement where a new builder says, 
obviously we're going with heat pumps. That's the only, that's the way it's done. At that point, you don't need to give incentives to people to, to make that choice that everybody's gonna make anyway. You need to start putting in regulations that say, you're not allowed to think about that. <laughs> that is not gonna work. That's not the heating system of the future. So the, the buildings working group really recommended that we keep building on the success of the efficiency main incentive programs and we track really carefully that tipping point where we need to make a change in the policy and go from incentives to regulations. Outstanding. Thank you very much and thank you for your work and thank you to everyone who joined me today. Uh, thank you to the folks uh, attending on the Zoom. Thank you to my panelists, Kathleen Meal from Maine Conservation Voters, Dana Fisher, Dana Fisher from Mitsubishi, and Vaughn Woodruff, the last minute man from InSource Renewables. Uh, it was great to have you on. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, for folks uh, attending at home, thank you. Uh, feel free to join Maine Audubon at mainaudubon.org. Uh, all the presentations, uh, this and the other presentations will be on there very soon. Have a great afternoon. Thanks again, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.